Former President Trump is making headlines, and that's putting it mildly, that have nothing to do with his plans to make a pitch to the American public in tomorrow night's debate. He's making headlines because he's pledging and has pledged on social media to prosecute political opponents. His threats are related to false claims that the 2020 election was stolen, something he admitted didn't happen even last week. And now some of those threats are saying he's going to punish, prosecute, and jail for long terms anyone involved in the 2024 election if he's unhappy with the result. I want to discuss that with our political panel. Nancy Cook is here, national politics reporter with Bloomberg News, and Dave Weigel with Semaphore. On what planet, Dave, does this make legal, political, or constitutional sense to go down this road for Trump? N not in any of those categories. And he's gone back and forth on this. I'm not trying to soft pedal it. He's gone back and forth. He's, he's demanded credit for not going after Hillary Clinton for, I don't know, what would have been the case in 2017. Right. And, he's, and he has regretted not going after his political opponents because uh, the way he frames every trial, every investigation, is that they're just trying to take him out. So it makes a lot of sense to Republicans. It's... It, Teeing up for tomorrow's debate, it's another example of the, the universe, the media universe that Donald Trump exists in right now is different than the one he had in 16 and 20. It's one where he, you say something like this and you get cheered for it. It's not one where you need to make new converts to convince people you're going to behave responsibly with power. Nancy? Well, I was in Palm Beach meeting with a bunch of his top campaign officials uh, last month, and they really want him to continue to talk about inflation, the economy, mm -hmm. and immigration. That is where polling shows he has a huge advantage with swing state voters, and they really feel like if he sticks with those messages, he'll be successful. But meanwhile, in the past week, we've seen him, you know, talk about jailing his political opponents. He, on Saturday, talked about imposing 100 percent tariffs on some countries. Uh, you know, he is promoting very extreme policies at a time when the election is so close in all these swing states with Harris. And I think that if he stuck to the issues where he did have the advantage, he would probably be doing potentially much better. And do statements like this, which Trump makes with frequency, alarm those closest to him in the inner circle advising him? I think that the people in the inner circle around him sort of believe what a lot of Trump advisors have long believed, that, you know, what he does or what he says, his rhetoric does not always match his action. But that is actually not true. I mean, we saw after he lost the 2020 election, he kept talking about how the election was stolen. Uh, you know, some of his advisors that I talked to when I covered the Trump mm -hmm. White House were talking about his second term agenda. And then we saw January 6th, where his followers tried to take back power and stop the certification of the election results. So I think that what we've seen about Trump in the past is that you do have to take these comments that he makes quite seriously. Uh, Dave and Nancy, I want to share with you some very new polling data from CBS News. I want to put this up. This is about the Senate races in the battleground states we reported on yesterday, showing a close race between the vice president and former President Trump. So in order, uh, let's go Michigan, Alyssa Slotkin, 48 percent, over Republican nominee Mike Rogers, 41 percent. We'll go to the next one, which is Pennsylvania. Bob Casey, the incumbent, 48 percent. Dave McCormick, the Republican nominee, 41 percent. Again, Democratic incumbent Tammy Baldwin in Wisconsin, 51 percent. Republican nominee Eric Hovde, 43 percent. All of these show mm -hmm. outside the margin of error leads for the Democrats and running again ahead of Kamala Harris. What does that tell you, Dave? It, these are also all opponents that Mitch McConnell likes. The, I should say Republican nominees that Mitch McConnell likes. These are not candidates who got over the line with the Trump endorsement in a primary and the party's embarrassed by them. They really wanted David McCormick to be the nominee yep. in Pennsylvania. They cleared the field. They really wanted Eric Hovde once it was clear Mike Gallagher was going to run for Senate. They really, it, it brought in Mike Rogers, who, who dropped a potential presidential race, which he probably would have lost, to do this. Uh, and you're seeing a separation everywhere. Uh, swing, swing states, let's, let's focus on the ones that have the Senate races. Um, it, Democrats are doing better with non-white voters and with younger white men uh, than Kamala Harris is. Trump is doing better with those voters than the rest of his ticket. Even I was in North Carolina last week. Mm -hmm. Even North Carolina, Mark Robinson, African-American lieutenant governor running for governor, been hit as across the- As the Republican. Yeah, yes. yeah, as the Republican, hit across the airways for controversial things he said on Facebook. He's doing worse to those voters than Donald Trump, uh, than Donald Trump is. So the, the party, for all the things Trump, Trump is doing that might hurt his campaign a given day, he has this appeal that has not translated down ballot. Nancy, is this just a power of incumbency, or is there something that these candidates are doing that Harris should pay closer attention to? Well, Harris
I should probably pay closer attention to it. But also it's just so striking because it's such a flip from where we mm -hmm. were earlier in the summer when, you know, Biden was still on the ticket and, uh, you know, Democrats were largely cautioning the rest of the party. People like House Speaker or former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi were saying, look, if Biden stays on the ticket, we're totally underwater in these Senate races. And so it's remarkable to me that just that with Harris ascending to the top of the tip ticket, she doesn't have numbers like they do, but the Senate races are just showing much more promise for the Democrats. And that's, the Senate is really sort of their weakest part of the map. And so I think that that is a good sign for them. And Dave, as you know, Democrats are being bullish about their prospects in the House, relatively bullish about Harris. Do you see a scenario in which if everything breaks Harris's way, they win all three? Uh, it, they would need to pull out, if not Montana, need to win a surprise in Texas or in Florida. There is no math that gets in the Senate without that. So it's still, you talk to even optimistic Democrats, they're, they're, they're thinking about a House that would, that would follow the Harris agenda, a Senate that would stimmy this or that. There's already some conversation about what you can offer to Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins, the Collins who I think would be, who'd be in cycle in maybe her final term, maybe not. Uh, so already, already getting ready over, for a world where right. there'd be some moderate Republicans who want, might want to move on. Because imagine this world where Kamala Harris defeats Donald Trump. He's dropped two in a row. What does somebody like Elisa Murkowski or Susan Collins think now? How much do they want to move on? Are they willing to deal on nominees or on immigration or something? See, we didn't talk about the debate at all. We talked about other <laughs> really cool stuff. Dave Weigel and Nancy Cook, thank you so very much.